the kickoff of the Central Vermont OSHA Ali program for 2023-24. For we have 11 programs and we have three movies as is uh, our tradition. We are in our 14th year and we are one of seven of the regional chapters of the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute. And we are so, so pleased to be kicking off the first of our 11 uh, programs with Linda Radke, who has been my neighbor for more than 40 years. We both live in Middlesex. After retiring from teaching at Harvard Union High School, she started to research old songs as a way to learn about history and has developed programs for the Vermont Humanities Council of Vermont songs and our history on vermont songs and our history sorry linda is a professional singer a founding member of counterpoint and frequent alto, alto soloist in the region she hosts the choral hour on vermont public every week today she shares what she's learned about the long fight for voting rights for women and the songs they sang she is accompanied by david gibson of Riverton. Without ado, here comes Linda Radke. <laughs> There's a wave of indignation rolling round and round the land, and its mission is so mighty, and its meaning is so grand, that none but knaves and cowards dare deny its just demand as we go marching on. Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? As we go marching on. Whence came your foolish notion, now so greatly overgrown, that a woman's sober judgment is not equal to your own? Has God ordained that suffrage is a gift for you alone? As we go marching on. Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? Men and brothers, dare you do it? As we go marching on. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so as our friend Pete Seeger said, if the audience knows the tune and you're having a rally, half your work is done. <laughs> and so a lot of times the suffrage movement used familiar songs and then put new words to them at the rallies and at the marches. It was an amazing journey for them for so many years. And I urge you afterwards to, to visit my little um, old school science fair project thing instead of having a, a PowerPoint, because I have pictures. Many of these women had portraits done, and also I have some information about Montpelier suffragists. I shouldn't even be talking. I don't have my gloves in, on. <laughs> I always wondered why the suffragists dressed so well, and they wanted to be taken seriously. And that was sort of the, the reason. The colors were purple, yellow, and of course, white. Um, if you were forced. Really? Yes. Oh, OK. <laughs> you sure? OK, yeah. good. OK. So um, I'm going to be talking about those 72 years, beginning with 1848 Women's Rights Convention in my hometown of Seneca Falls, New York. And actually, when I grew up there, there was no women's history being taught. So the actual site, if you've been to the National Park there, was the laundromat. And it had like a little tiny New York sign on the side on this site. So I was so grateful in the 70s with those fe 70 feminists and the federal government to go in and really look at women's history. And for me, looking at women's history in Vermont led me to some of the leaders of the suffrage movement. Then I kept on, during, this is during COVID, I kept on reading and reading and reading and finding out more about the suffrage movement that has been recently researched. Certainly the people who were left out of the movement. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there now uh, that I can learn about. Um, but when I was growing up, I remember Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She, our school was named for her, but I had no idea who she was. There was a big picture of her, and we thought she was Mrs. Santa Claus or something. <laughs> She's really, really beautiful as an older woman. And um, also, I went back to my 50th high school reunion, and I looked at our old American history textbook, which was a New York State textbook. And I looked up women's suffrage, one sentence. In 1920, women were given the vote. 
<laughs> and so we know it took you know decades and decades. Many of these women never lived to to vote, but they came in many many different generations. And what I want to focus on too, besides the songs, is how they used persuasion, because nobody gives up power without a fight. And so they began with more genteel methods of persuasion, and then by the time 70 years had gone by, you know, you, politeness will only get you so far. <laughs> so then I'll talk, talk about the rallies and the picketing and the marches on Washington. So the first song I want to sing comes from the early days, and it's called, um, I Will Speak My Mind If I Die For It. <laughs> and it reminds me of Gilbert and Sullivan a little bit. Um, eight, it's very early, 1852. And at that point in Vermont history, I think one woman had dared to speak to the legislature so far you know, to, about women's suffrage. And at that point, it was just municipal suffrage. So initially, they came from the parlor. Like the women would get together. Women's clubs were really central to every community. And they would talk about issues of the day. Then if they got geared up to try to do a petition, their next step would be the church, usually the church basement. Um, there are a lot of allies among the pastors, especially the Methodists and the Unitarian, which in those days was the Church of the Messiah. And they often could use the basement while the church was heated or for prayer meetings or something and meet. Next step, the town hall. And that was hard because a lot of women had no, no training in public speaking unless you were Quaker, then you were allowed to speak. So that took a lot. And then the state legislature, of course, and then to Washington, D.C. So it was a long haul thing, and this is from 1920. But you think about the time of this song, women were in hoop skirts and corsets. And um, I love this one because it's, it's pretty radical, but I think it was probably just meant for women singing together. And the covers of the music are over there. And often it would say, this tune is sung by Mrs. John Smith. <laughs> you know, it'd be some vaudeville act or something. So I, it was really hard because women had no names. So I had to really work on it. <laughs> so here it is. I will speak my mind if I die for it. Men tell us tis fit for wives to submit to their husbands submissively weakly. And whatever they say, their wives should obey submissively, definitely weakly. My, I'm sorry. Unquestioning, stupidly making. Our husbands would force us their own dictum take without ever a wherefore or why for it. But I don't, and I can't, and I won't, and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. For we know it's all fudge to say man is the best judge of what should be and shouldn't and so on. That women should bow nor attempt to say how they consider the matter to go on. I never yet gave up myself such a slave, however my husband might try for it. But I won't and I can't and I won't and I shan't. No, I will speak my mind if I die for it. And you ladies, I hope with the husbands to cope with the rights of the sex will not trifle. We all, if we choose our tongues but to use, can all opposition soon stifle. Let man, if he will, then bid us be still and silent, a price he'll pay high for it. For we won't and we can't and we don't and we shan't. Let us all speak our minds if we die for it. <laughs> Thank you. So initially, it wasn't about voting. Uh, initially, it was about other rights of women, uh, certainly to own property, to inherit property. Uh, and then eventually in Vermont, but in the 1880s, women were given the chance to vote only in municipal elections. So it was a gradual thing. And in Seneca Falls, on the Declaration of the Rights of Women, at the end, it talks about women perhaps voting. And I remember uh, here reading that Elizabeth Cady Stanton wanted to put that in. She was the radical of the group. And Lucretia Mott, the, uh, the Quaker, said, no, Lizzie, thou would make us look ridiculous. Like, that's just <laughs> too far. So it's interesting how it started off gradually and then just kind of snowballed. And uh, how did they try to convince other people, especially men? And one was using something that people, 
everybody considers a very important word in their language, which is mother. And the idea that we love and respect our mothers, how could we, how could we insult them by not allowing them to have full citizenship? And I thought it was interesting because that's a very emotional, emotional appeal. And later on, they had this whole debate about whether voting would sort of take women away from their proper, uh, you know, their proper role in the home and with the children. Big debate there. So this tune is another one that's from the Civil War. Uh, it's actually sung at rallies and also at uh, General Sherman, Sherman's funeral, I think. But this is the new words, and it's called Giving the Ballot to the Mothers. And I want to dedicate this to a Montpelier woman. Her, uh, her name is Phoebe Stone Beeman. And uh, her husband was a Methodist minister. He was also a suffragist. And by the way, a suffragette was something they used in England. But here, they tried to figure out what to do because so many men were part of the movement, either from temperance, for prohibition, or for abolition of slavery, or for women's rights. And they tried to call them suffragettes for a while. <laughs> and they, they really were, were really important because some of them had power. So her husband was the Methodist minister. And, um, she was in the first class at Wesleyan University to admit women. That was 1870s. And uh, she became a member of the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Movement. And then she became the president of the Vermont Equal Suffrage Association. And at one point, I love this, um, she, by the way, she died in 1913, never got a chance to vote nationally. But one of the meetings, she brought her child to the meeting. And somebody in the newspaper wrote, it's, it's important that she's showing that women can still care for children and still be involved in public affairs. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the song, Giving the Ballot to the Mothers. Bring the good old bugle boys, we'll sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the cause along. Sing it as we ought to sing it, cheerily and strong. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll sing the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we'll sing this chorus from the mountains to the sea. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Bring the dear old banner boys and fling it to the wind. Mothers, wives, and daughters, let it shelter and defend. Equal rights, our motto is we're loyal to the end. Giving the ballot to the mothers. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, our spirits shall be free. So we sing this chorus from the mountains to the sea. Giving the ballot to the mothers. And later in, on, one of our last songs also talks about mother, but it's from the time of this costume. And they sort of changed the, the appeal, not so much to your mother, but to the mother of your children and to your daughters. So I'll read that, do that later. I'm going to dedicate this next one to one of the suffragists who was important in Vermont. Because every year, from 1852 on, women would petition. They'd run around everywhere, all these little towns, and get petitions signed by hundreds and hundreds of Vermonters, presented to the legislature. Some people spoke. The debate continued, continued. And then what happens, it would go back and forth in the 1880s. Other states were already voting, women were vo voting already. So one year, it would be the legislature would say no, and then the Senate would say yes. And the next year, it would be the opposite. You know, and they worked and worked and worked and lobbied and, and spoke. And finally, right around 1919, they got both houses of the legislature to say yes. But the governor at that time, Percival Clement, a blessed memory, <laughs> refused to call a special session to, uh, to ratify the 19th Amendment. So we were not part of the original states to do that. So we got to vote 1920 when the federal government told us to. But guess what? The women got to vote in 1920, and Percival Clement was not elected. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, who became governor is James Hartness, who was an industrialist from Springfield. And I've heard stories about him and how he treated women at his factories the same. They had special rooms where they could leave their clothes. They had, uh, during the Civil War, they were, they were working, but also when men came home, they were still paid the same. 
So Hartness's picture is up there in my honor roll because he was a suffragist and he, it was scary at that time to you know, stand up for that. So he was, he was, um, he was elected. So this next one, um, I'll, elect, I'll do that for James Hartness, is sort of a vaudeville song. Um, <laughs> it's about a man and a woman arguing about women's rights and like, Doc, like Governor Clement, the woman is saying, we're going to eventually get the vote. We know this. So you might want to join us now <laughs> because it will be important in the future. And of course, you know, 1920, three out of five voters were women. So it did make a lot of difference. So I have to play both parts because David doesn't want to sing. OK, so here we go. Winning the vote. I've been down to Boston, boys, to see the folks and sights. Dear me, I heard of such fuss and noise about these women's rights. Now it's as plain as my old coat, that's plain as plain can be, that when you women want the vote, they'll get no help from me. Not from Joe, not from Joe, and he knows it. Not from Joseph, no, no, no. Not from Joe, not from me, I tell you no. Joseph, tell us something new. We're tired of that old song. We'll sew the seams and cook your meals. To vote won't take us long. We will help clean house, the one too large for men to leave alone. The state and nation, don't you see, when we the vote have won. Yes, we will, and you'll help, for you'll need our help, friend Joseph. Yes, you will, when you're in, so you better help us win. You're just right how blind I've been. I ne'er had seen it thus. Tis true, our taxes you must pay without a word of fuss. You are subject to the laws men make without a word or note. Can you sing out where it will count? I'll help you win the vote. Yes, I will. Thank you, Joe. We'll together soon be voters. Yes, we will. If you'll all vote next at the vote polls next fall. And here, here's another argument that really worked in the early days, not talking about women's rights or feminism, the word taxes, because every boy went to school learning about taxation without representation, and say, we pay taxes, and uh, we own property at that point, and uh, why can't we have any say in things? And that was sort of persuasive, logically, I think. This next one I'm going to dedicate to two people. First is Lucy Daniels from Grafton. She was kind of a pariah in her day, but now they're putting up big signs and she, they're very proud of her. She was a wealthy woman who inherited property quite a bit in Grafton, and she refused to pay her property tax because she could not vote. So the town fathers, and they were fathers, took away some of her property. So that was a catalyzing force for Miss Daniels. So she went to Washington, D.C. She was part of the women who did that huge parade on, uh, got on Wilson's inauguration day, took all the attention away from him, picketed, and finally you know, won the vote. She came back to Grafton and no one would speak to her. And they had written terrible things on her barn. So what she did, according to some oral histories, is that she went around town and gave 50 cents to every girl she saw, a little girl, and said, I'll pay you to go to town meeting because go to town meeting because by the time you're an adult, you'll be able to participate. So Lucy Daniels. And then here in Montpelier, Susan Isabel Doty Hansen. We know the name Doty. Um, she was a teacher in Montpelier. Her husband also was, was an ally. He was a local doctor and he was part of the Prohibition Party. And um, she was the one who planned the big suffrage parade in Montpelier in 1919 and got to meet with the governor, Percival Clement, to no avail. She was president of the Vermont Women's Club, or the Montpelier Women's Club, which is a really important force in town. And also later on, she ran a variety store in downtown Montpelier. So this tune is, again, it's um, using a persuasive strategy that has to do with the housekeeping. They mentioned in the last song. She said, we'll help you clean house. We'll sew your seams, we'll cook your meals, but we'll clean up the house that's too big for man to clean alone 
which is the state and the nation. So what that was called was um, enlarged housekeeping. They didn't want to argue that they weren't going to do the housekeeping or that they were going to neglect their home duties. What they were saying is women have always been responsible for the poor and the neglected in their communities. They do charitable work. They help children who are poor or orphans. Now they can help you clean up the mess that you've made of your town. And you know, help us because cleaning things up is sort of our what we do. <laughs> and of course, in the beginning, they thought women were all sweetness and light and would always just bring a, a high moral ground to everything they did. So this uses um, Uncle Sam, the idea in the t tune of Yankee Doodle. And there's a great cover design where Uncle Sam's walking down the road looking like Peter Schumann from Bread and Puppet. And then on, on his arm is, uh, is a, a housewife with a, with a broom. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> of all the songs that have been sung within our state and nation, there's none that comes so near the heart than Uncle Sam's relation. Yankee Doodle is his name, U.S. is common station. Red and white and starry blue, his garb on each occasion. When Uncle Sam set up this house, he welcomed every brother. But in the haste of his new life, he quite forgot his mother. Now his nephews are on us. Now his house is up in arms. A housewife, he must find him to sweep and dust and set to rights the tangles all around him. Uncle Sam is long in years, and he is growing wiser. He can say twas his mistake to have no misadvisor. His nephews now have got the reins and looking o'er their shoulder. Shout to good old Uncle Stan, goodbye dear old man forever. One more. Now we're here, dear Uncle Sam, to help you in your trouble. And then the first thing best to do is making you a double. Yankee Doodle will be glad to join with us in spreading the news about all the land of Uncle Sam's great wedding. <laughs> Thank you. Some of the worry about women voting was that because we have apparently, we did anyway, a high moral standing in all things, that all of a sudden we will start to bring about legislation that a lot of the people in power did not want. As you can guess, it was opposed by a lot of the factory owners because they knew, and it happened, that limitations would be put on child labor. The first legislator in Montpelier, Edna Beard from Orange, the first female, she had the temerity to, to actually propose a bill that children's working hours be limited to 10 hours a day. And it was voted down. But they knew, the people in power knew that this was going to be tough because especially the liquor traffic and the women and the men in the WCTU looking at temperance, they knew prohibition would really impact their business. So there's a lot of fight from the big powers in the whole country. But that idea that we would clean up the mess continued, that we would be the domestic goddess, we'd be that angel at the hearth, but also in our communities. So this is a, a wonderful Vermonter. Her name is Annette Parmerly from Enosburg Falls. And uh, she's, she was a really strong Methodist, WCTU prohibitionist, her husband as well. And uh, she would go around and talk to everyone about women's voting. Um, a lot of these women, by the way, had support at home. Other women faced the ostracism of their families. And she did. And uh, she, she used humor. So in other words, she, knew, she didn't want to make people, you know, you only get so far by, by yelling at people about injustice. So at the beginning, she would say things like, let's have, um, they had a mock parliament in Bristol, Vermont, where women got dressed up as the judges. And they were debating whether or not men were ready for the vote. <laughs> And it was an entertainment. It used humor. And one of the, I don't, we don't have the script anymore. But one of the arguments was that men are too emotional. <laughs> because whenever they're at a sporting event, they just lose their minds. <laughs> and the other one that they remembered or they wrote about was that women, they believe, uh, when there was a conflict, knew better than to resort to fisticuffs. And so they had to use negotiation. They didn't use the word negotiation, but they had to use reasoning and persuasion to get their way. Uh, so Annette was called Annette the Hornet, 
or Annette the Suffragette. And uh, she just kept on going. And it was interesting, I went up to see where she lived and they said that the name of the sports team in Enosburg is the Hornets, but I don't think it has anything to do with Annette. <laughs> so she used humor. The one thing that was disappointing to me later on is she had arguments for uh, women voting that were racist. Um, and also there was a great deal of anti-immigrant sentiment at that point. And so she said, if women can vote, if native born women can vote, meaning white women, um, if native born women can vote, then they will, out, they will outvote the steerage. They will outvote the uneducated, the, you know, the sort of deplorable voters that we don't want in. So there was a big argument too about what they called educated voters, voters, whatever that is. And so Annette did fall into that, that trap, but still, she's a hero. This is, was a march, um, and that's one of the reasons why the hens went up a little bit. They were doing a lot of marching. It was their way before you know, radio and access to any kind of newspapers. And this is one of the songs they marched from. <laughs> What means these votes for women? Just this the time has come When we may voice with free men Concerns of land and home Then snap the ancient tether Enthralling us too long And stoutly pull together To right a grievous wrong Shout the song of votes for women Ring it out upon the air here it's no cheap patriot freemen who the right will dare sing aloud with lusty vigor to hood brittles earth and sky that the woman's cause grows bigger and the woman's day draws nigh the votes of sisters, brothers, mothers in every sovereign state for us and many others light the gloom of fate. The joyless haunt of drudges where children toil and die may find these votes the judges that ask the reason why. Shout the song of votes for women, sing it out upon the air. Sing aloud it, nasty free men, who the right will dare. Sing aloud with lusty vigor till it rattles earth and sky. That the woman's cause grows bigger and the woman's day draws nigh. Thank you. So you notice the allusion to children toiling and dying and that women's, women's influence will help those poor people. The other thing that Annette Parmalee suggested uh, didn't happen right away. She said, I think a woman should be appointed to every board of trustees of institutions that serve women and children, the so-called insane asylums, uh, the, poor, the poor farms, those kind of things. So, you know, even though they couldn't vote, they should serve on those committees. And eventually in Vermont, women did get a chance to vote for a school board president, not serve as a school board. And then eventually women got to be town clerks. And of course now I think pretty much all of the, all the town clerks are women. So um, when you go to your town hall, you'll see if they keep their records. Uh, in 1920, you'll look up the names of the women who registered to vote uh, in Vermont and took the Freeman's Oath. And uh, it's pretty neat. I, in Middlesex, there were 18 women, and many of them would sign it things like Mrs. John Smith, so that's kind of hard. But I, I did find a lot of them were wives of some prominent people in the town, might be a business owner or a minister or something. And I was working with a ninth grade boy from Harwood, and he had to do some community service for some hijinks, I don't know what it was. So he had to work for the town clerk. And so I said, come on over here, look at this book, read me the names and I'll type them out. And he kept on looking at it, beautiful penmanship. He, he said, what is this? It was cursive. <laughs> so it was really neat to say, if you're interested in history, here's what it looks like, it's not that hard except for the cue. <laughs> so you can find out more about Montpelier over there uh, because I didn't realize this about the poll tax. I knew that you had to pay your property tax in those days. You had to own property to vote, but you also had to pay your poll tax. And in 1920, it was $6, no, $3 in 1919. In 1920, it went up to $6. And so there's a place you can look up the current inflation calculator, $92. 
So you can imagine the, the, the people, the voters, who were left out of that, just as we talk about voting rights today. Um, so the big, the big argument, I guess, was that, that women, um, women were part of the natural order of God. And so Christian women were such a part of this. I'll have, I have a Jewish supper just later, but most of them were Christian, most of them were Protestant. And they could find evidence, we could find evidence in the scriptures of both sides. Either Adam and Eve, we are subservient, or some meth pests that say we're all equal in God's eyes. So they'd argue about this. And every once in a while, one person, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, would be too radical for the time. And she said, you know, I think the Christian, the Christian church is detrimental to the lives of women. And the rest of the suffragists were going, because <laughs> that was their base. You know, so that argument kept on going. But often they would use hymns, um, familiar hymns if they were Protestant, and put new words on them. And so this one I'm going to dedicate to my grandmother. She, her name was Minnie Clemens, and she told me that she first voted in 1920. And ever since then, she, she whispered that she'd been voting sort of opposite from her husband <laughs> and never told him. And I was really proud of, of Minnie, and because she had signed the pledge, uh, Francis Willard had this pledge for temperance. I had to sign it too. And did anybody know the pledge? Lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. <laughs> so many of them were intensely religious and thought that alcohol was ruining the lives of women and children, which, you know, especially people living in poverty, but everybody. So Lucia, I think it's Lucia instead of Lucia, Bailey Bliss went up, uh, was educated in the Montpelier schools a, memory of, a member of the Unitarian Church, and she attended Smith College. Uh, she became president, too, of the Montpelier Women's Club. She got a chance to vote. She lived till 1967. Uh, but at one point in April, she marched with 400 women downtown and uh, wanted to speak with Governor Clement, and they weren't allowed to. And she's buried over here in Greenmount Cemetery. This is a, a hymn you might know. And it was sung at the centennial of the country, so that would be 1876. We're talking about women's suffrage, and they're thinking about what the world will be like 100 years hence. What a utopia in 1976 there will be. And here, here is their vision of that. You might know the tune. 100 years hence, what a change will be made in politics, morals, religion, and trade, in statesmen who wrangle and ride on the fence, these things will be altered 100 years hence. Our laws then will be unconforceable rules, our prisons converted to national schools, the pleasure of sinning, it's all a pretense, and so we will find it 100 years hence. Oppression and war will be heard of no more, nor the blood of a slave leave his print on our shore. Our conventions will then be a useless expense, for we'll all go free suffrage 100 years hence. Instead of speech making to satisfy wrong, all will join our glad chorus to sing freedom's song. And if the millennium is not a pretense, we'll all be good neighbors 100 years hence. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> oh. I love that, though, that utopian ideal of America, that we can live up to that. Uh, you know, 100 years hence, maybe not, maybe not 200 years hence. But in terms of their vision in the progressive era, it's, it's, it's really wonderfully gutsy. And again, they were saying this in their communities, and not in church so much, but maybe in the meetings after church. This next song I'll dedicate to another um, Vermonter, well, Montpelier woman. And her name is Lucia, again, Ellen Casey, this is the word we know, Blanchard. And her husband ran, I think it was, he had a hardware store on 35 Main, so I have to go back and see where that was. She became a teacher when she was 18, as many women did, 
And what her big goal was, was to write to the legislature all the time. And so she, that's what she did to try to keep on proposing this, at least some white rights for women. And then she became a president of the Vermont Equal Suffrage Association. They had these conventions around the state every year. And then eventually Green Mountain Cemetery, Seminary, which was in Waterbury, she taught there for a while. And uh, she planned this big state convention right at the end, 1919. And she got a speaker, Ch Carrie Chapman Catt, to come up, which was an amazing coup for her. She was a great leader in the last push for women's suffrage. So this next song, is, oh, these are so great. This is about women going to the polls and getting the stink eye from the men who are waiting, and also talking about this horrible idea, in a way, that why, why can, I think Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, why, why cannot a field, she didn't say hand, but why can a field hand vote who's male and a woman who went to Vassar College cannot? So there was a lot of that kind of distancing. Um, this is sort of got, got ugly, and one of the ugly things had to do with anti-immigration and the Irish. And the Irish, the connecting of the Irish to drinking and the connecting with prohibition. And so a lot of times they would say, look at that drunk, you know, waiting in line to vote. And he doesn't deserve it. So here it is. And this is another familiar song. If the men should see the women going to the polls to put down the liquor traffic, need it vex their souls. If we're angels, as they tell us, can we once suppose that all the men will frown on us when going to the polls? We love our boys, our household joys. We love our girls as well. The law of love is from above, against that we ne'er rebel. No discharge have Christian women from the war with sin. At the polls with Gog and Magog must our fight begin. Since we Bible marching orders need it fright our souls, so all the men should frown on us when going to the polls. We love our boys, our household joys. We love our girls as well. The right of, sorry, the law of love is from above, against that we ne'er rebel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I found a, p a poster. I didn't want to bring it in. It's just so disturbing. But it's from Life Magazine, 1919. And it says, four voters. And it has four figures in the front. And one of them is clearly a drunkard. One of them is clearly um, kind of a gang member. It says, black hand behind him. Or a, maybe a sort of one of those Tammany Hall people. Uh, oh, yeah, one is a black man. I can't remember what the other one is. But um, then there's a woman, woman in the center, and she's wearing all white and has a parasol. And the, the, the thing is, four voters. Oh, four voters, those un undesirable deplorables are voting and not this pure, wonderful woman. Um, so that's, there's a lot of racism that comes into the movement as well. And uh, that's, that's why I've enjoyed reading more about the black women's clubs and how they continued to press on even though they were often shunned by their white sisters. And the other thing that happened um, was they talked about the women's hour. This is the women's hour. They'd worked for uh, abolition of slavery. And the amendment came, and black men got the vote, but women did not. And I think the reasoning was that the country was not ready for two radical changes at one time. And so one of my heroes, unfortunately, Phillips Brooks, who was a great abolitionist, said, this is not the women's hour. This is the Negro's hour. So wait and be patient. It'll come soon. So it was 1920. I'm going to dedicate this to Mary Ware Foster. She was born in Montpelier. And she attended the Church of the Messiah, which is the early name for the Unitarians. And she met um, Lucy Stone, whose picture is over there too. Lucy Stone was not a Vermonter, but she came up here a lot to try to win the women of Vermont to the sense that we were, a lot of us were kind of resistant to it. We thought we had plenty of votes. We didn't really understand the need for it. So Lucy Stone and these other out of town people would come and, and speak. And Lucy Stone was married to another suffragist Harry Blackwell, they were really strong activists. 
But when they married, she decided to keep her name. Yes. And so those, those women were called the stoners. I just love that. <laughs> and so she, um, she was a member that Mary Foster was part of uh, giving this suffrage bill to introduce municipal suffrage, which eventually was passed. Um, so this next song, well, I want to read this one thing about, no, I'll talk about one black suffragist who's an amazing hero. Ida B. Wells is over there. She was a journalist, had a bad marriage, and uh, so it left it, and wrote a lot about anti-lynch. She wrote about anti-lynching and other things in the South. And then she became a suffragist in Illinois, very prominent. And when uh, women had that huge um, parade in Washington, D.C., with all the delegations of every single state, um, they said, no, we don't want your delegation to march. You can be in the back of the parade. This is 1920, and so Ida B. stood on the curb, and when the Illinois delegation went by, she just stepped off the curb and continued, and what could they do? <laughs> so I love Ida B. Um, but a lot of the, the opposition they, came, they, they faced had to do with women from the South and the North for various reasons. Um, so this is something, another song of persuasion, and it's talking to a man who believes where women's place is in the home. And uh, then the last stanza is, think about an earnest and thoughtful man who can see beyond that sphere to women choosing a sphere. Familiar song. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find, who knows it all without debate and never changed his mind. I asked him what of women's rights, he said in tone severe, my mind on that is all made up, keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb forth from the pub house come, he squandered all his cash for drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him, should not women vote? He answered with a sneer, I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago, who pondered deep all human love, the honest truth to know. I asked him what of women's cause, his answer came sincere. Her rights are just the same as mine. Let woman choose her sphere. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm one of those 70s, 70s feminists. And I remember that big debate about, you know, women's sphere, is, it should be in the home, you know, and why are women stepping out and doing all these radical things? But the other thing, looking back at Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she was the writer of the early movement. She had seven children. She stayed in Seneca Falls. Brilliant legal mind, uh, so she wrote so much. And in this one, she again is a little ahead of the game. She said, I think that even maternity should be voluntary. Yeah, and of course the people got, oh, no. you know, that was way before Margaret Sanger too. So anyway, so the, um, the movement changed quite a bit as the years went on. As I said, we didn't, they didn't make much traction in the rural New England, but they did make a lot of traction in the cities. And New York State got women's suffrage much before we did because of the factories and the recent immigrants who came and the idea of labor unions because unlike maybe a Vermont housewife who wasn't in poverty, the women in the tenements on the east side, they couldn't choose what kind of water their children were drinking or what the sanitation was like or what kind of food they were eating. They had no power at all. So the, the movement sort of split aside at this point and they started to publish um, brochures in the different languages of the immigrants. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, you know, I don't think uneducated voters, uneducated women should vote or men. And her sister Harriet, who is also a suffragist of the next generation said, I just met a man who was sweeping the floor he was a recent immigrant, he can quote German, he can quote Goethe in German. He's not stupid, he's not uneducated. He just needs to learn English too. And so that was a big debate. And this next song is in Yiddish, part of that movement. 
And uh, we're going to get to dedicate this to Ernestine Rose. Her picture is there. She was a daughter of a rabbi in Poland, but kind of a free thinker. So she left for America. And when she got there, she realized she could not uh, buy any property. She couldn't own property. So she worked for that initially, but also for the rights of married women to have a say in child custody cases, because that was the man's choice usually, and unless he was really you know, bad. And so she was part of the movement. And, but again, she was a cultural Jew, but not a practicing Jew. But still, it was tough for the women who were running the, the thing. And at one point, she said, but you know, I'm not really Jewish. I don't believe in God. <laughs> and I'm grateful to Avram Pat, many of you know him, because my Yiddish is not so great. So uh, he helped me for translating it, too. Now, this is a song that's using humor. Bessie Tomaszewski was the queen of Yiddish theater in New York, very popular. And um, she and her husband had these great shows. And she was very popular, but she used humor. And uh, later on, by the way, she and her husband moved to Hollywood, changed their name to Thomas instead of Tomaszewski. Uh, their grandchild is Michael Tilson Thomas. And there's a great PBS special on the Tomaszewskis. Here's the, here's the sort of ge general idea of this song. When women get the same rights as men, we'll have all the power and we'll be able to come home dead drunk from the saloon in the middle of the night <laughs> and he'll have nothing to say about it. And also, we will no longer work like slaves. And in the future, men will have the babies for us so we can keep our flat stomachs. <laughs> What's more, elections will all be in our hands. And the president will kiss every woman in the country 300 times. And we'll be the police. So two or three of us would stand on a street corner. And when a thief is caught, if he gives us a kiss, he'll be free. <laughs> Viel Neues bringt jetzt a Ross die Zeit. Ich denk, es ist nicht so schlecht. Die Farbe wählen kein Gleichspielleid. Sie kämpfen was zu bedirekt. Verschiedene Frauen für alle Rassen sehen in kleiner als plainer. Sie läufen a Rimmen mit Spitzen gegassen. Massen a Streit mit die Männer. In sie schreien, prüf nur treuen. Wer nicht mit ihr dann bereit. So the dort gibt's in Plan, Herr nicht, sie viel den Mann. Tom er heute Moira, wird für ach sein Licht. Kaum kippt er schwitzt sie gehen, fiert ihm, sorry, fiert ihm bald in sie gehen. Schäst sie groß, schäst Frau aus Leben zu Frauenrecht. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, I don't know. How'd I do, anybody? <laughs> Well, it's hard. It's, it, it's, it's fun because I speak German, too, so it's really fun to do that. I found that in the Library of Congress, so that's not a Vermont song. Um, so now we're getting to the end of the suffrage movement, in a way. And uh, there are a lot of other people I want to talk about. And one is Electra Havemeyer Webb. You probably know her from Shelburne. Very, very wealthy woman. And she actually became part of the suffrage movement, very educated woman. She went down and she marched in that enormous parade. Uh, let's see, how many were there? 40,000 people voting in that in Washington, DC on the day of President Wilson's inauguration. And it was a violent one. They did have you know, men help, trying to help, but there, were a lot of, there was a lot of violence. And she was one of the women who was hauled off and sent to jail. She was a friend of Alice Paul, who again was part of the last more radical suffragist movements. And I can tell about that later. So you can see that the gentility of the early days has kind of gone to, we're going to just step out, we're going to do it and take whatever. But women, you probably know this, women, some of the women were force fed in this horrible prison. And they, they weren't as radical in terms of disruptive as the British women. But they had that perseverance, didn't they? So um, the, the National Women's Party was founded because many women believe that women during World War I should not get involved in the war. Many of them were pacifists. Uh, the Women's International League for Peace and, Free Peace and Justice, Peace and Freedom, which is still around, was saying, no, we should not get, get involved in this foreign war. But other women said, we're citizens. We should be citizens. We need to help. And that really served them well, because many of them worked you know, in hospitals, drove ambulances, did all kinds of things in World War I all around the country. 
So it was hard for President Wilson, who was a Southerner and opposed to suffrage, to sort of resist that, that sort of what was happening in the whole country. Um, so finally, that history caught up with him. And uh, I think a lot of it was the women's public service that they did. But the, the party split in half. That's the, the tragedy of this, that women's suffrage was unified, then it split over black people getting the, black men getting the vote, then it split again over religion, then it split again over political activism. And so it would have come, come sooner, I think. And also, it would have been sooner if they had not been allied to the temperance movement. That was probably, you know, not political, but it's what they felt. So they kept on, kept on the pressure, and I'm going to dedicate this to the last person, the first person to vote who was in the 1848 convention in Seneca Falls. Her name was Charlotte Woodward. She was a Quaker, and she was a glove maker in Gloversville, New York. And can you imagine, they got this thing together in less than a week. This is without radio, without internet. Somehow, people came to this thing in 1848, and she was only 19 years old, and she went in a carriage with a bunch of other Quakers, and she was still alive in 1920 and was able to vote. All the other women had died by then. And so I, I really think about that and that commitment to something that they will not live to see. Um, sorry, <clears throat> sorry. I had one more story I want to tell you. Oh, yeah, Northfield. I don't know where that town hall used to be, but when finally the federal government said um, women have to vote, they swept out the, um, all the, the, the hay from the bottom of the um, town, town hall because men were spitting tobacco on the floor and they thought they'd clean it up for the women. And then they also put chairs along the side of the hall for the women to sit. And I thought, well, that's a little bit disrespectful. Can't they just sit where the men are sitting? But I realized they wanted to make them feel comfortable. And also they had these enormous skirts. And so that was their way of making them feel welcome, I think. Um, the last story is, uh, there's a book called The Woman's Hour by Elaine Weiss that I recommend. It reads like a thriller, even though you know that eventually it passed. Does anybody know what the last state to ratify the 19th Amendment was? It surprised me. Tennessee. Yes, really surprised me. But they gave up on Vermont. Connecticut was still out, but they said, no, it's not going to work. Work. They went down to Tennessee, and Cher Carrie Chapman Catt, Alice Paul, went down and established their bulkhead there at a, a Hermitage Hotel in Nashville. And upstairs, the anti-suffragists set up their place. It was called the Jack Daniels Lounge. <laughs> <laughs> and so they worked really hard to try to lobby these legislators to vote. It wasn't going their way, and they had roses. If you were uh, pro-suffrage, you wore a yellow rose. If you were anti, you wore a red rose. A lot of women also were against suffrage in the South. But the argument they used, again, was if our women are voting, our women are voting, that way any votes from the Negroes that you haven't suppressed, they'll be out outnumbered. And so they used that argument as a politically expedient argument, and it worked. And so this is the song that they sang at the end of the, the movement Alice Paul, who was not a, a domestic person at all, but she wanted to make a show of it, they had this big banner, and every time a new state was added, she would sew the star on and put it over the balcony. So this comes from that, and it's a Confederate anthem because they knew they were in Tennessee. There is a band of women, and to our manner born, emerging from the darkness past and looking toward the morn. Their mothers labored, waited in a night without a star. The morning showed our suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah, for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. This band is all reforming. War shall be at an end. Fit on bayonets and swords shall rust. We'll use the brain, the pen. Laden with precious freight now, thunders our progress car. A headlamp waves our suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. Hurrah, hurrah for equal rights, hurrah. Hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. One more time. Hurrah, hurrah for 
equal rights, hurrah, hurrah for the suffrage flag that bears the woman's star. <laughs> so the vote was won. Um, and Alice Paul, by the way, had a summer home up in Barton. And I haven't found much more about that. I'm trying to. She had a long life after that. Um, and she also traveled a bit. And in 1920, after we had the vote, she spoke at the church I grew up in in Seneca Falls, the Presbyterian Church, about something called the Equal Rights Amendment that she was proposing in 1920. <laughs> so here it is, November 2nd, 1920. My grandmother is voting. Uh, one third of those eligible voted for the first time. And, uh, but again, there, there were a lot, and, and including the First Lady Edith Wilson, who was against suffrage. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt was initially against suffrage. I'd like to know more about that. That doesn't sound like, like Eleanor. But it was a pretty good start. First of all, Clement didn't get elected. And, but I don't want to leave, leave you with a sense of, tr of um, triumph, because of course we know about suppression of voting rights. And also we know to whom these votes were, whom these votes were meant for. Native Americans, of course, were left out. And the court case came. And that was in 1948. Native Americans could vote in national elections. And there was finally a holdout. That was the state of Utah. But they finally were convinced in 1962. I think they could vote in federal, but not in state at that point. Um, and then Chinese Americans, 1956, after they, what they've done for this country. And then Japanese Americans, 1952. Shameful. So we know that it was a hard-won battle, and we know that it's not done. So I'm going to sing one more song, and then we're going to have a, um, a sing-along, and then we're going to have some questions. I hope you have a lot to share. If you have a story about a new American voting for the first time, if anybody's been to those wonderful ceremonies, tell it to, tell it to me or tell it to the group. Also, if any member of your family talked about the first woman who voted in your family, and the other thing I want to tell you is please speak out about this history to everyone who's younger than we are. A, woman, a young woman was helping me put together this, this thing, and she said, wait a minute, that's in the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I mean, it didn't, it's illogical to her. Why in the world would you separate out women? That's what she just, So it's really important that the story gets told of this. And obviously, during the centennial, we had all these plans, and then COVID hit. We were going to have a huge parade then. So I'm glad that you invited me back, because women's history and voting rights are still relevant. So now we've received the vote, but the, the idea of a suffragist has changed. There's a cartoon over there that shows an early suffragist. And they thought, oh, these are just either women that no men would want, and they're ugly, and they had warts on, and they had awful clothes. And that was the sort of stereotype of the, the suffragists. By 1916, anyway, suffragists were fashionable. They were cute. They were sexy. There were a lot of these wonderful Tin Pan Alley songs about you beautiful suffragette. So again, things had changed. And this was written by, um, well, by a man who worked in the same publishing firm as George Gershwin. So you can hear a lot of that 1920s jazz. First song mentioned mother. This one mentions mother as well. And the title is the best and the cover design. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. No man is greater than his mother No man is half so good No man is better than the wife he loves Her love will guide him Whatever betide him She's good enough to love you and adore you. She's good enough to bear your troubles for you. And if your tears were falling today, nobody else would kiss them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you're all lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother, and she's good enough to vote with you. Men plunge this world in war and sadness. We must protest in vain. Let's hope and pray someday we'll hear her say, stop all this madness 
I bring you gladness. She's good enough to love you and adore you. She's good enough to bear your troubles for you. And if your tears were falling today, nobody else would kiss them away. She's good enough to warm your heart with kisses when you're all lonesome and blue. She's good enough to be your baby's mother. And she's good enough to vote with you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we're going to end with a rally song. And we know it. Everybody knows it. It's been used so many times through the years. So I can think of the old you know, Pete Seeger ones, peace rallies, um, solidarity, all these things. And I could find some wonderful lyrics, but I didn't want to sing like 20 verses. So I picked the best ones. And you'll do the chorus. And again, Pete Seeger said, the concert ain't over until the audience sings. So here we go. You'll know it. <clears throat> it's the right of every woman to mark out her path in life, or to be a saint or soldier or a true and loving wife, to fill the soul with gladness and recall the world from strife as we go marching on. Ready? It's her right to serve her nation in its every hour of need. Her right to sit in judgment on her country's faith and creed and show the world her courage by some high heroic deed as she goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. As we go marching best verse. It's her right to train the children in the home and in the school. Her right to frame statutes and determine who shall rule. And like man to cast her ballot for a statesman or a fool as she goes marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. And thanks to Ali and Osher and where's the Rogues Gallery here? Yeah, Mary Just Skinner, my neighbor, who, who rock walks by my house every day and has asked me about this for a year. Edie Miller, Allison Underhill, thank you. Ginny Callen, Bob Rosenfeld, and Marge Zinder. Thank you so much for organizing this way for people to get together and learn something, you know? Yeah. All right, so questions or comments or things that you want to share with everybody. Hi. I wondered how the suffragists in the United States differed from the suffragettes in England. Was it just two names for the same goals? Not at all. Good, thank you. She asked was the same goals, and they were the same goals, but different strategies. Uh, the suffragettes, and I bet there's a lot of reasons for this, were much more disruptive. Uh, they actually blew things up. <laughs> and they actually rang, rang bells when statesmen were trying to speak. And you know, they, were, they were amazing. But they, and a woman was actually killed during one of these parades. So they, and so Alice Paul, the last person who was sort of in charge, she was trained there. So she was the one who came back and said, ladies, <laughs> you know, being polite will only get you so far. Maybe you have to go to jail. So that was their argument. And my argument is that American women weren't going to jump to that right away. Uh, and these were middle class and upper middle class women, basically, you know, in the beginning. And so they did start off with these other strategies that were very gentle and persuasive. Comment question? When did the vote come in England? Oh, wow, I should know that. I think in 1917, I think. Before us. Yeah. And I hate Mayor Poppins because they sort of trivialized the suffragettes, you know. But they were a bunch of courageous women and very, very radical. Anything else? And also, you know, in many countries, you mentioned the Taliban earlier, 
many countries, you know, women are still fighting for the vote. I think Switzerland was like 1970-something. <laughs> so. I know it is. Hi, Mary. If just have a quick suggestion. Yes. In future, I'm so glad I came here. I've heard about it for years. Uh, have somebody standing at your bulletin boards and point out. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because, yes. Or I could have that little pointer because I, we're, yeah, because Osher is um, is filming us. I just didn't dare. But let me just give you a quick rose rose gallery because there's some I didn't talk about. I love these pictures. It makes them feel real to me. So um, Annette Parmerly is here, the suffragette. <laughs> um, this is Lucy Daniels, who wouldn't pay her property tax. James Hartness is over there. Uh, Clarina Howard Nichols, who is a great a worker for suffrage, but also women's rights, ended up going out to Kansas and working for anti-slavery things. And I think there's a women's center named for her. And this is Addie Esty. She was one of the Green Mountain Girls who went to Washington and uh, got to speak to President Wilson. And here are some things that Paul Carnahan from the History Center found. Um, about the poll tax and how women weren't getting the word that even though they took the Freeman's oath in front of the city council, I mean, it was a big deal, you also had to pay property tax if you owed it and also that poll tax. And women didn't, it wasn't part of our culture. And so I think that's part of the reason why the suffrage movement turned into the League of Women Voters to try to get that information out to people. Um, let's see. Oh, and that's Alice Paul. And yeah, and Ida B is over here too. Yeah, so come on over afterwards and um, sort of look, especially in these uh, covers of the, the magazines too. And any other questions? Anybody know uh, anybody who voted for the first time in 1920? No? Yeah. I think my grandmother and great grandmother voted. Yeah, grandmother and great. Did they ever talk about it? My great grandmother did. Wow. She was. She lived to be nice. Six. And she was a pistol. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> she lived out at, she grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, but then she lived in Chicago later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she was, and I remember her taking me to the Chicago convention back in 1960, and I was running along trying to keep up with her. Mm -hmm. And I was like 13, and she was. In their 90s. What a great, what a great yeah. model for you. Yeah. I hope she didn't go to the 68 convention in Chicago. They were, <laughs> if she was 90, whatever. <laughs> Thank you for that story. Yeah. And if you've ever sponsored a new American, that just makes you know that you should never forget to vote, you know, once you see the, the work that people do so that they can. The other story. Here's the Oh. Uh, you mentioned the colors. Yes. Does that have significance, the colors? Yes, yes. So, and I think they all had symbolism too. So white was purity, and you certainly see that now with women in Congress wearing white. But since this was for a parade, I didn't want to wear too much white. And um, purple, and then the green, um, I don't know why later on, but then that idea of the yellow rose. So they just, they came up with a color scheme. They had a good, good branding, I guess. And the idea of the men wearing the yellow rose to show that they supported it, just like your flag of Ukraine. <laughs> yep. So there were colors. And also this idea of dressing up. Um, I was talking to a college, college girl who just came back and has changed all her politics, you know, enjoying sort of re resisting her parents' goals. And she said, oh my god, that, those women suffragists were all racists. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's a more nuanced story than that. There's certainly there's a, lot of, a lot of uncomfortable things to learn about this movement, but it worked. <laughs> so, any others? Well, thank you very much, and please stay, stay on. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Yeah. Linda, for uh, a really wonderful presentation. Thank you. I have been a long-time feminist, and I learned a lot today. So okay. I know that uh, I'm probably not alone in this crowd. There's so much information. It gets me excited to read all the things that Linda has. Oh, I've got a house that I walk by every Oh, day. I've got a book list of a stack, because that's what I did during COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I said, really? Black suffragists didn't know. Yeah. It's a long, long fight. I remember when I first moved to Vermont, and I was studying for the bar exam in 1972, and Louise Swainbank, who was a representative from St. Johnsbury, 
knew I was a lawyer, and she asked me to get involved in the Equal Rights Amendment fight the very first time around. And here I was, fresh out of law school, and I ended up being a speaker um, to oppose Phyllis Schlafly when she came to the office. It was like, wow, what a memory. I mean, I was wow. just so excited that I could get involved in making a difference, which I thought, you know, at that when I was so young. And so oh, yeah. the fight goes on, though, because as we know, the Equal Rights Amendment didn't pass. And thank goodness that we've done, made, made some progress in other areas, but you can never really let your guard down because <coughs> There's so many people who are wanting to take us back to the old days. So, Linda, uh, I am so pleased that I finally got to see it. I've, I've heard it and seen you all around, and I never have done it. And I just thank you so much. Thank you. And the other thing I've learned, I got to go around to different towns um, after COVID for the Humanities Council, and I get to do the same thing for every town. So you get in, there's always a historical center uh, society. It's usually like three women doing all the job. You know, it's like high school prom, but, but anyway, they, they can go to the town clerk and I can make it, and it's really, really inspiring how these women sort of stepped up because they had no access to power at that point. And actually, um, Lois Jackson, who made this costume, she's a, yeah, a customer from Chelsea. Chelsea. Yeah. Chelsea. Yeah. And, oh, look at this. Look at, look at the <laughs> lining. I mean, oh. lining. Nobody can see the lining. Anyway, bound buttonholes. But in any event, thank you so no, much for kicking us off. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, oh, 23, 24. what's Seriously. next? What's next week? And I was just about to tell you that the September twenty seventh meeting is to learn about Medicare and all the variations no. just before with the open enrollment period and just before we start getting Joe Namath telling us about Medicare Advantage plans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're going to learn the nitty gritty uh, uh, from. Um, let me see. Somebody who knows. <laughs> Somebody who knows from Specialist Council on Aging, Christine Melichert. I think I pronounced that correctly. So thank you again for coming. And thank we'll you. And we'll see you next Wednesday at 1 o'clock. I'll see you up by the Science Fair.